The following interview was conducted with J. William Asher, Professor Emeritus of Educational Studies for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took place on Tuesday, October 6, 2009 in Stewart Center. The interviewer was Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, thank Professor you. Asher, and thank you very much. We'll start with tell us where and when you were born and your siblings in early years. Well, I grew up in Gary, Indiana. Okay. My father was in a principal of a high school there. Uh, we're about sixth or seventh generation in Western Indiana. My great, 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 great grandfather was an officer with George Rogers Clark uh, and was killed in Indiana by Indians during the Revolutionary War. His son was about 15 or 16 years old, was also with him. We don't really know how old he was because he was illiterate. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, but his son did move up to Owen County, which is three counties south of here, and the family has been there ever since. And my uh, daughter and her husband still own part of the land that we had down there, and they're getting ready to buy some land and ask who uh, Harry Asher was, and it turns out it was my grandfather. So we keep going uh, all that time. And my mother was from Vincennes, east uh, of Vincennes, in a little town called Friston. And her family has actually been here longer than mine. Uh, my great 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 grandfather came up about 1821, and uh, the Knox County Courthouse burned down in 1812, so it burned the land records before that. But the family was there at least at that time, so mm -hmm. we've been here a long time. I uh, so I grew up in Gary, went to uh, high school and grade school and high school in Gary. Can you tell us a little about it and tell us about high school, what, any clubs or things? Well, I went to Lou Wallace High School in uh, General Lou Wallace uh, from Crawfordsville. Uh, so our yearbook was called The Quill and Blade, and uh, I don't ever recommend going to high school where your father was principal. It doesn't really work very well. But uh, William A. Wirt and the Gary School System was well known as probably the most progressive educational school system in the United States was blessed by John Dewey personally uh, at one time. And William A. Wirt was the superintendent, and my father was a great admirer of him, as he should have been, because he was a very able man. He uh, went to DePauw University, just south of here, and I think my father pushed me to go to DePauw because of that as much as anything else. And uh, so between Gary and Greencastle and Owen County and Knox County and Tippecanoe County. I've gone up and down the west coast of Indiana for quite a few years. Sure. Do you have any siblings, any brothers no, or no sisters? No, no brothers and You're sisters. You're the only child. Yep. Okay. Tell us a little bit about uh, campus life, college, what your major was at DePaul. And I, was I gather you must have lived on campus. I, well, that was the only place you really could live almost. Okay. Uh, uh, I was a psychology major psychology major for my master's and psychology major for my PhD so I've got a lot of psych background uh, and when I came to Purdue I was uh, a quarter time in the psych department taught uh, measurement theory uh, and taught one semester of statistics 600 with uh, Ben Weiner who was well known here for years and years I can tell you there's no glory in having an alternative class with Ben Weiner <laughs> who everybody admired and you kind of struggle through. Uh, Tell us, let's back to college a little bit. Were there any student organizations that um, I belong, was campus? I belong to uh, a semi-independent organization called Men's Hall Association. There was only one men's residence hall, and it was a voluntary organization, so not everybody in the hall was a member of MHA. But uh, we were the ones that uh, caused this Methodist University with a Methodist minister president to finally allow blacks to live in the hall, which I'm very proud of. And we had uh, some very famous now black uh, men who uh, became uh, lawyers and advisors to President Clinton. and uh, who, were, who went there to school? Who went to DePauw. Sure. And... Uh, I think I knew five congressmen who were with me in school at one time. Probably uh, Hamilton was the most well-known, but uh, there were, uh, let's see, uh, George Crane had two boys there. George Crane 
had a newspaper column called uh, the clinic, <laughs> the worry clinic. He was also a psychologist. He was a syndicated columnist. Wasn't syndicated, he? well known, uh, sure. and where I probably first became interested in psychology. Mm -hmm. But uh, DePaul was excellent when I was there. It's even better now. Uh, I'm trying to see if I can't get my inveigle my one of my grandsons to go there because I think it would be a very good fit. Sure. But uh, we'll have to see. Did you come straight from there to Purdue? Yes. Oh. Well, between oh. high school and DePaul, I, uh, I graduated in 1945 from high school, uh -huh. and World War II was going on. And so I enlisted uh, when I was still 17 years old and still in high school. And the Navy let me continue in high school until I graduated. By that time, the war in Europe was over, so they didn't quite know what to do with us. And by the time they figured it out, the war in Japan was over, and so they delayed further. And uh, where were you delayed at? Were you at I was at home. Oh, <laughs> oh yeah, and you waiting, been waiting, waiting to be called up to for active the call, duty. Right? Right. And my father got tired of me sitting around and sleeping till eleven o'clock. So finally, he said, uh, "Well, Valparaiso University of Valparaiso was in a quarter system, and they're just starting. So uh, on the first of October, so you could go over there." So I went on a Sunday, stayed in university housing, ate breakfast and lunch, went through uh, registration, which was enormous because all the GIs were coming back. And I finally got out of the place at four o'clock in the afternoon and there's my mother with everything in the car packed up, waving the envelope saying, your orders came. <laughs> So I'm a one-day alum of the <laughs> University of Valparaiso. I registered, right? <laughs> yeah. It came and went. And. Uh, so then I went to boot camp in October, and they were still being concerned what to do with radar technicians, which was what I had enlisted as. And so after uh, eight weeks or six weeks, something like that, uh, they hauled us out of boot camp. Where was boot camp? Uh, Great Lakes. Okay. And went to Hugh Manley High School in Chicago, which the Navy had taken over for pre-radio school. And uh, after that, I went down to uh, Gulfport, Mississippi. And they used to say, if God was going to give the earth an enema, Gulfport would be the place where he'd put the plunger. So uh, I had a choice of Navy Pier, which was about an hour and a half from home. I had uh, Treasure Island in the middle of San Francisco Bay, which would have been wonderful. And there was a major hotel that had been given to the Navy, Dumont, Del Monte Hotel, and so we had four places, and I got Gulfport, Mississippi, which, but I did get to New Orleans quite a bit and have really enjoyed it and gone back ever since I've had a chance. Mm -hmm. And then I got out, to, uh, the, oh, and then I went to uh, Maine Navy, Washington, D.C., in the Bureau of Ordnance and uh, ran IBM machines and made my rate as an IBM operator, third class, Good. and uh, when I got, so that last, so I had a grand total of 10 months active duty and about 12 or 15 reserve, and uh, in order to keep my rate, I enlisted in the reserves, and when I got home, my uncle was inspector instructor of the naval district I was in, and he said, you will be active duty reserve, won't you, and uh, when your uncle says yes, and he's a lieutenant commander, you do it. <laughs> uh, yes, but I didn't regret it. Uh, when I went to DePauw, I uh, was seriously considering continuing, but they didn't have an ROTC down there. When I came to Purdue, I went over to the Navy ROTC and said, uh, have you got any uh, opportunities for an ex-enlisted, or a continuing enlisted man, because I still was okay. enlisted. And they said, no, but we have an active reserve here. It meets on, at night and so I went over there and uh, it was a communication technician reserve had uh, English professor as the commanding officer and a physics uh, graduate of DePauw who was working with Kerry Quad and uh, another English professor and a batch of junior officers who were graduate students in physics and I'd been there about uh, four or five six months Korean War was going on, and they called up every petty officer in my company except me because I was an IBM machine operator, and they didn't need them. 
but all the other petty officers were engineering students or physics students or chemistry students and they needed them desperately. So I went from being the junior petty officer to the leading petty officer. <laughs> Promotions come fast. Yeah. Well, I never did get promoted, but at least... Uh, Responsibilities. Uh, I got, I think, uh, one day's pay and I was making about $72 a month, so it was $2 and a half or something like that, which wasn't bad money. Uh, because every three months I got a check for about 15 or $20 and uh, graduate assistantships were paying 150 and after taxes it was 131 yeah. So the extra $12 came in handy. And, uh, right. So uh, I came to, uh, I guess that finishes DePaul. Right. I came to Purdue right out of undergraduate school and that was the f fall of 1950. So I've been here 60 years next fall. Purdue uh, was down to about 16 or 18,000 students then, and they were very happy because they'd been up to 22 or 23 uh, right after the war. So the place had come down. Hubdy was president. Was uh, the, were still some of the uh, veterans from World War II? Were oh, they, they had here? all kinds of veterans. Oh, here. yeah, right after that, uh, too. Because I've heard of the rush that came after the Right war. after the war, they had an enormous amount. And, and no had, housing. and No housing, and everybody with a college degree who could teach math <laughs> was in a classroom somewhere. And uh, so it was a great time. And were you married at that time? No, no, no. Okay. I didn't get married till I was almost out of graduate school, okay. which was five years later. But, what uh, was the campus like, and where'd you live when you got here? What was well, like? I got here late, and now, I was used, to, used to having a place. In September, right? Yeah, September. Actually, yeah, it was September, because right. they started in the middle of September okay. in those days. Right. And uh, I was used to campus housing or Navy housing or whatever. And it was quite a shock to have to find my own housing. And I finally, and being so late, I was right at the edge of town, which was on uh, Carrollton Street, which is just around the corner from the stoplight on Grant Street, <laughs> right. Salisbury. Right. Yeah. But, but from my back room, I could see 52, and there was nothing between me and 52 at that I time. I love that. <laughs> and uh, it was a guy who was an adjunct, who was a professor of education but he was on the uh, extension service nice people and I stayed a year and then moved down uh, you had an apartment in the house I had a room everybody oh. stayed in rooms in those days okay, right. uh, the, uh, women were all housed in, ca in campus housing and men generally had rooms although carry quad uh, for undergraduates sure and uh, they all we all ate in the Union cafeteria there was four lines uh, and they were busy the whole time. And interesting because uh, I'd, I ate there three meals a day and uh, for under $2 a day, <laughs> can you believe? Right. And my mother came through for something and said she'd take me out to lunch. And I figured, well, we'll go out to a restaurant. Instead, she took me to the Union Cafeteria and afterwards said, now I'll take you to the woman who runs this place. Uh, her name is in... Uh, Did you even Nugent? Would that have been Miss Nugent? Nugent. Nugent. Yeah, I've heard and so she, much about this woman. She was... She was something else. She was, and uh, she had been my mother's cooking teacher at Indiana State when my mother went to college. What a small world. Yeah. She well, was here for years. I mean, she was one of the first ones that ran that thing, I understand. Yeah, probably. Yeah. And, and uh, I would be willing to bet that she had her own scholarship fund because everybody who came to school with no money, just enough to pay the $65 tuition or whatever it was in those days, and they usually had a room with a roommate, so that was $12 and a half or something a month, and they worked in the union cafeteria for meals and uh, whatever they could make, and when they finally ran out of money, they usually went up to Miss Nugent and said, I've got to leave, I'm quitting, and I'm sure that she said why, and they said, well, I'm out of money. And she knew if they were good workers and good students that I'm sure, I, I don't know, but I'm sure that she helped out, super, uh, subsidized quite a few students on the way through. Uh, she was a very nice lady. Right. Uh, Heard many things, many stories. Yeah, and she was there forever and ever, ever and ever. Right, right, yeah. And uh, everybody else complained about the union food. I thought it was wonderful. 
Of course, my mother cooked the same thing at home I was getting in the union. So why I wonder would, why, right? Yeah, I, why, why wouldn't I have been very happy? Same recipes, right? <laughs> yeah, well, there was sure. a pea salad that was just exactly like my mother used to make. <laughs> and they had mashed potatoes every day, and the leftover potatoes they made into potato pancakes. And my mother did exactly the same thing. And so uh, I like that. <laughs> I was very happy with you right. food. I knew it was good yeah. and well done, well prepared. Yeah. Yeah. And for less than $2 a day. Right. What was the um, village like in those days when you first came? I usually ask Well, that. we, the family farms being three counties south of here, sure. uh, we went down frequently and, of course, came through Lafayette and West Lafayette. Did you Lafayette. hitchhike or did you have a car? Or? Well, my parents brought me. Oh, okay. I was ten, seven, eight, ten years old. Okay. And every now and, and in those days, you came down uh, northwestern to State Street, turn left, went across the, not, it's now the pedestrian bridge to 4th Street, 3rd Street, Street, went bridge. around and over out 4th Street. Sure, okay. And every now and then we would come down Grant Street and stop and there was a cafeteria where the bookstore is now and we would eat over there. So I knew about Purdue from younger years. long ago. Sure. Uh, came by the administration building on Northwestern and so I knew about the place. Right, yeah. And in high school, with Purdue being so close in a state university, if you took four years of math and either physics or chemistry or both, it was just assumed that you were going to go to Purdue and be an engineer. And a math teacher gave us a big folder and you wrote down all the basics so that when you got to Purdue you had it all. And uh, But somehow I missed it <laughs> going to DePaul, but where I told them I wanted to be an engineer and they said, fine, fine, you know, you take a couple years here and then transfer, and of course you never did, but... Uh, so it worked out beautifully. Yeah. But, uh, right. An awful lot of my friends came to Purdue in engineering. Uh, a guy I went to boot camp had had two years of electrical engineering, and uh, I looked. Uh, electrical engineering has all their graduates' pictures on the first floor, basement floor. And I looked up in about 47 or 48, there's his picture uh, finished. And I read the obituaries the other day, and there was a guy named Kenny Dull that was my two-door down neighbor in Gary, came to Purdue, and uh, he was either a mechanical or civil engineer, I'm not sure, but uh, he died. But, you know, just hundreds of people that I knew went to went Purdue. Went to Purdue, that's right, yeah. And, uh, Did they have the uh, streetcar that went up Grand Street when you were here? Yeah, oh. well, it came over and parked behind what is now the home, I guess even today, the home Mac building. It sure. went down State Street and around there, and they had a switch where it could turn around and come right, back. I understand that. And uh, you still see the, where the streetcar tracks are over on uh, Salisbury Street going, turning left to go down uh, uh, Stadium Street. Sure. Uh, right. You can see it underneath the pavement. All right, yeah. But well, then you, you did, uh, so you got your master's and your PhD, just went straight through in psychology? Well, uh, I've been on the GI Bill. Okay. And uh, so that was a big help. Well, was my it? father would have sent me. Okay. But, uh, and I went to Gary College <laughs> because I couldn't get into uh, DePaul the first, oh, when I, I see. got out. Uh, I knew I was going to get out in August, and I said, I can be here for the beginning of the semester. And he says, we're already full, uh, but you can come in February. So I went to Gary College, which William A. Word had started. I uh, met in Horseman High School at night and had just excellent faculty because they were all from the University of Chicago or Northwestern and <laughs> coming out at night on the South Shore. Sure, right. uh, and then uh, went to DePaul and Greencastle in February uh, for the second semester. Mm -hmm. My father did pay for that. And uh, the next September, when I was getting ready to go to school, he said, do you need money? And I said, well, no, I don't think so because I can be on the GI Bill. And they paid for three full years of DePaul's tuition, which was the highest in the state of Indiana at $225 a semester, four fifty a year for the most expensive school in Indiana. And uh, Well, Purdue didn't have tuition. You just had fees. Well, $65 sure. or 55 or you, you didn't even save up for it because it was so little. Right, yeah. Uh, so, and then I worked in the steel mill. And then I worked in the school board labor gang, which paid even better than the steel mill. So uh, when I, in the summertime when I was at DePauw, and so when I came here, I had money, no mm -hmm. problem. Yeah, you were in good shape. So I uh, didn't have an assistantship, didn't know enough to ask for one. 
didn't need it. Uh, tuition was so small, eating for less than $2 a day, and I lived high. Your living expenses were really low. I lived high because uh, I had a room all by myself. Everybody else shared a room, so that was $25. So when you count $60 for meals for the month and 25 for a room, I actually had a car, <laughs> which was interesting because I would drive down from Carrollton Street, park on Grant Street next to the Union regularly, all the time. And I was really irritated if, if there wasn't a parking place there and I'd park over by the, uh, the Fidel house, <laughs> which I considered a long way away. <laughs> and In those days, that was a long way. <laughs> yeah, so uh, <laughs> I took courses like crazy because you know, everybody else took two courses and, and then went in the summer and gradually over two years got their master's while well, I knocked it off in one semester or two semesters in a summer. And then I went to graduate school, uh, doctorate, and I again took all kinds of courses for a year. And then uh, I got an assistantship over in audiology and speech uh, with Max Steer. Mm, that they, was nice. They had a Navy contract. It was 12 months. Uh, he had uh, secretarial help. We had engineering help for equipment. Uh, the, he sent us to conventions. Uh, we, uh, I was on a Navy contract, and pretty much you could, uh, open-ended, you could, well, the first year I was there, I uh, edited uh, the guy who had been there before me, who hadn't finished all the reports, and so he sent him back from his job out in Kansas somewhere, and I edited that, and then the boss said, well, uh, it's time for you to get started on some research, what do you have in mind? So I said something, and he said, fine. And uh, one, that was two years half-time and one year full-time. And one of those, uh, we went out to San Diego to do recordings on Navy ships and uh, got paid per diem the whole time, which was, I think, $12 a day or something like that. And we stayed in the Navy BOQ, another guy and I uh, who had also been in the Navy <laughs> two enlisted men staying in the bachelor officer's quarters and we were a little concerned about how much it was going to cost and so the guy sat down and said how long are you going to be here and we said like three weeks and he gets out his pencil and he figures and he figures and he finally said it was to be a dollar 75 or something like that <laughs> so we made money <laughs> you're okay yep and went out on ships out on a submarine for a couple of days and out on escort carrier for a week and uh, did recordings in the uh, what do they call it uh, anyway where the communications sure, were which right. were pretty much brand new in those days sure uh, and uh, got my thesis out of it because uh, and I got a batch of publications which you saw because oh, yeah. I got, all, got on all those Navy uh, contract reports, and uh, where was the uh, were your classes in uh, education was or what was known what at one time the education building is that where most of them were held? most of it was CACs. Oh, okay. Because I was in psychology. Oh, okay, right. Uh, Harriet O'Shea was in the basement of education, okay. and uh, Hadley was had a brand new clinical program which was in the basement of education. Okay. And I did take a course with Hadley in clinical. Of course, I was taking courses like crazy because I, sure. I, I, I took 15 hours, and then I took 18, and then one semester I took 21. Oh, my God. We were really uh, going great guns. And, and so I piled up hours like crazy. Uh, audiology and speech was part of the speech department, and Alan H. Monroe was head of it, and he was very well known and was one of the major speech departments in the United States. And we had theater, we had convocations, we had uh, debate, we had forensics, uh, and I think practically everybody at Purdue undergraduate had to take a semester of speech. So yeah, Probably, just like they do today. And uh, <clears throat> But being in the speech department, we got uh, comp tickets to the theater, which was in Fowler Hall, which was where the old building used sure. to be here. Sure. So I had a wonderful time, uh, and... Uh, Got my th thesis essentially paid for, dictated the uh, 
lit review to the secretary. Uh, in those days, you got one rough draft and one final copy, and that was about all that you could get. And so I dictated, edited, gave it back to her, reworked it, edited it again, got the whole thing typed on the company time, and uh, they paid for the, pub the, the binding and everything else. And that was published in Speech Monographs, which I find out after the fact that it was one of the premier journals in speech. So my first journal article was in the speech department. What could be better? Great. And uh, Well, now, what came next then after that? Uh, then finished? I went up to the Purdue Calumet Development Foundation. Okay. How did, what brought uh, an interest in that? R.B. Stewart said, gee, we have extension service for farmers. We really ought to have a type of extension service for uh, uh, cities. Uh, was R.B. the uh, treasurer at that time? Okay. And R.B. always made things work two ways and three ways. Every buck that came in, he came back and came back again. And so this was a uh, in East Chicago, and the steel company didn't trust the politicians, and the politicians didn't trust the steel company, and they needed uh, redevelopment. So they did trust the university, and we got uh, Purdue got appointed to be uh, the director of uh, run the place, and R.B. said, well, you really need a Purdue graduate up there to tie the university to East Chicago. And so the criterion was behavioral or social sciences, Ph.D. from Purdue, and be familiar with the Calumet area. And I think I was the only one that met it. So uh, I worked in East Chicago and went back and lived in Gary again. I got married uh, on the strength of did, that job. Did you, oh, did you meet your wife up there or down No, there? I met her here. Okay. In fact, I have two wives that have master's degrees from Purdue, so I keep the, tradu keep Purdue keep tradition, the tradition. It worked so well the first time, try it again. There you go. This wife has two degrees from Purdue, so it both worked very well. Uh -huh. uh, and around here, a home ec major, uh, she had a master's, a bachelor's and a master's in home ec nutrition. And around here, a home ec major had a terrible time getting a job because all the home ec majors around here. But up in East Chicago, one of the people was on the Munster School Board, and he says, oh, what's, uh, what's your wife doing? I said, well, she's a home ec major. And he quick closed the door and said, uh, before anybody else gets you, we need home ec teachers. He says, I don't need one in Munster, but I need one in Hammond. <laughs> I'll make some calls and set it up. So she taught in George Rogers Clark School, which is clear in the north end of Hammond, 7th and 8th grade because she uh, only had a temporary teaching certificate and couldn't teach in high school. And one of her subjects was Indiana history, and she lived in New Jersey all her life. But <laughs> We made it through. and uh, We can do it. Yeah. So... Uh, that was a good experience, but it wasn't really quite in my field. And then, uh, how long were you up there? I was there a year. Oh, okay. And H. H. Remmers, who was uh, a major psychology ed psych, particularly, ran Educational Reference, which did uh, research work for the university in education, was on my committee, and he was also on the Commissioner of Education's committee to get through an extramural research program in education by the federal government, which didn't have one at that time. And then when they set up the advisory committee, he was on that as well. And they needed three staff members. Uh, and they, the one that they needed for me was somebody who knew research while well, I had all these publications. And uh, my thesis was... Uh, on how bungling the the Air Force had been in developing intelligibility and high-level noise tests. And then Ohio State did the same thing, and I pointed out that both of them analyzed it wrong in, in the modern way. And uh, I had a batch of other public, because I could do my own research and, on that contract, so I had a factor analysis, and I had this, and I had that. And I had a chapter in my thesis, which was a summary of the literature, and the next chapter was a review of the literature where I took all the people apart who hadn't done it right. Correct. And I think Remmers was impressed by that and recommended me. So I got the job as a research coordinator in what was then the Office of Education. Uh, three of us. 
here at Purdue? No, this was Washington, D.C. I was back in Washington again. Okay. I had uh, six months in the Bureau of Ordnance in Maine Navy. Every time you see one of those War in the Pacific films, they have this five-deck building with the big white front. It's on Constitution Avenue, and that's I was on the fourth deck in the first wing, uh, ran IBM machines. Secretary of Navy and our office were the only two in the whole building that were air-conditioned because the secretary wanted it, and we and had, you, to, have and you had of, to have it right. because of the machines. Sure, gotcha. And uh, <clears throat> we were one deck below and one wing over from where they had done the original breaking of the Japanese codes. And uh, so, uh, and great opportunity. Oh. Well, yeah. yeah. Uh, Good location. And we uh, worked days, and then we worked four to twelve. And when we worked four to twelve, we ate over in the waves quarters, which were over in the tidal basin. And uh, we had a a walkway across the uh, Lincoln Memorial reflecting pool. The best view of the Lincoln Memorial is up about 30, 35 feet, right smack in the middle of that reflecting pool looking down on, and at night, of course, they had the lights on, and I still remember that, and it's not there anymore. They right. tore the building down and tore the walkway down, but sure. uh, it was a great view. And I learned a trade, IBM machine operator, which Eventually, you had previous experience. Well, I was. You, that's what you were doing. Uh, well, in the Navy. But, that's right, in the Navy. Uh, uh, right. So when I uh, came back, I worked in the steel mill. One of the places I worked uh, after I was in the Navy was in the uh, accounting department running IBM machines. And they were happy to have me because of vacation time and a guy who could actually knew what he was doing. Sure, sure. So uh, Those people were few and far between yeah, in those days. Yeah, and... Uh, I didn't make as much as if I'd been in the mill, but I got some overtime, uh, and it was nice, clean work. <laughs> that's right, that's right. I'd worked in number one open hearth, and then number two open hearth, I worked under the Bessemer converter, I worked out in the Coke plant. <laughs> so uh, when they talk about clean air, people ask me if I ever smoked, and I said, no, I didn't have to, all I had to do was inhale from <laughs> from the Coke plant and the Bessemer converter. <laughs> Uh, but let's see. Then, and then you came back. To go. What you came back after that? Project. Oh, uh, yeah. Then uh, back to I spent four years, uh, and all three of us. We had one guy who was a new higher ed. We had one woman who uh, was a government hand, and me who knew research methods and stat and measurement and so forth. All of us were veterans, <laughs> because of the civil service gave you an extra five points. Uh, the, the guy who went from higher ed had been a lieutenant in the Navy in Ecuador, uh, which I later went to, and he had some friends down there, so he set me up. And the woman was a captain in the WAC who uh, had been a school teacher and then in the original WAC and then finally in the regular Army WAC. Sure. Okay. And uh, that was a good experience because I went to most of the major universities in the United States negotiating contracts for educational research, including Purdue, <laughs> which was interesting because uh, I got one in the speech department because I knew Max Steer. I got uh, a couple in psychology, one, I think one in child development somewhere, but we never got one in education, <laughs> interesting enough. Remmers was on the advisory committee one third of the staff was from Purdue, and education never had the horses to be able to meet the competition. Right. Yeah. So uh, after, but I spent a lot of time answering congressional mail and writing budget supports in addition to the technical work that I did, which gets very boring after you do it f four years in a row. So I wanted to get out and get back in higher ed. So then I went to the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, and by the way, I have been an, I was an associate professor at Pitt. I came, then I made full professor there, and I came here as a full professor, but I've been called a lot of nasty things in my life, but never assistant professor, because I skipped that as a result of being out five years and having all those publications and being in the Office of Education. Did so, you get tenure with the, with the associate? No. Uh, you, 
you had to, it was three years, but at the end of the first year, they gave me tenure, okay. which was very nice and quite a compliment, really. That's right, that's right. Uh, and Pitt was on the trimester system, and it said once you had six semesters of teaching, you had eligible for a sabbatical. And I was on the trimester system, so I went up to the dean and said, you know, I've been here three years. That's 12 semesters. Uh, am I eligible for a sabbatical? He said, I don't know. Uh, I'll go ask. And it turns out I was. So the fourth year, I got a sabbatical to Harvard. Uh, I was, again, uh, on the IBM fellowship to the computing center uh, in the, from the School of Education. And so I uh, picked up the whole family and moved to the Boston area. Was your sabbatical for the whole year then? Took the sabbatical, but it turned out to be one-third salary, which was quite a pinch. But nevertheless, uh, met a lot of people, had some excellent coursework, uh, read enormously because after five years, uh, four years in the government and four years teaching, I was now, well, I always told people that for every year in the government, you get one year behind academically because the field moves on and you don't. So I really needed, to, uh, by that time, computers had really come in, and I just absolutely had to update myself. So this was the Perfect opportunity. Perfect timing. Yeah. Good, good time. So I uh, came back, and uh, by that time, the chancellor had wanted, Pitt was in the middle of uh, a batch of streetcar tracks. And he said, I want to get this university looking outside the streetcar tracks and go more international. So he got a contract with USAID with Universidad Central in Ecuador. And uh, they needed some Spanish-speaking people. And having gone to DePauw and had to take foreign language, uh, I, and they needed a psychologist. And I was in the School of Ed. But nobody in the psych department wanted the job because they knew that if two years down there, they would be obsolete by the time they came back. So I told the dean, I said, you know, you want a psychologist? I have three degrees in psychology. Uh, I had uh, 16 hours of college Spanish. Uh, I can proudly handle it on 90 days at a time. I Fine, wonderful. Uh, that was in uh, May. They said, well... Well, you're hired. All you really need now is the USAID clearance. I thought clearance to be in a university in South America. Uh, probably they wanted somebody who wasn't going to inspire communists down there or whatever. When I was in the Navy Reserve here at Purdue, it being a communication reserve, I had a top secret cryptographic clearance. You don't get any higher than that. I thought, well, you know, this will be a duck soup. They fiddled and faddled until October, getting my clearance through. Typical government. Typical government. Uh, so I went down on the 1st of October. Did you take your family with you? And No, uh, but my, my parents, I, I was there for three months, and I told my wife, as part of the deal, I'll bring you down for one month, and my parents volunteered to come to Pittsburgh to take care of the kids, which was really you know, when you're that old and taking care of four little kids under the age of six, it's quite a job. So, uh, but they did. And so she came down, and she also happened to uh, have had two years of Spanish. And the embarrassing thing was that I'd been there five, six weeks, and my Spanish was just getting up to the point where I could understand what people were saying to me. I, I couldn't always. Most of the time I couldn't get the words, but at least I could understand what the Spanish was. She was there a week, and she was more fluent than I was. And uh, they always had big parties for new people coming down, and we had a lot of parties, and she went very well with, and was speaking Spanish to everybody. And finally one of the guys I was working with went to the boss and said, you know, we really need a guy in psychology and he can back up the guy in education who's having a terrible time with the language. His wife also speaks Spanish and she gets along with everybody. Why don't we bring him down for a year and we can count the three months you're here. It's not two years, which I didn't want. And I said, fine, that'll work out beautifully because I'll just take my 
month's vacation back in the States so I can go to my fellowship in Harvard. And the guy says, fine, i got to clear it with USAID in Ecuador. And the guy said, fine, wonderful. He says, but i got to clear it with Washington. It turns out that the guy that I met in Panama, because I stopped on the way down to uh, take a look at the Panama Canal that my friend had set me up with, and uh, in those days the Panamanian airport was south of the canal, out practically in the jungle, a bunch of concert huts. Everything was in Spanish. And I'm there, and I'm reading. I can read Spanish pretty well, and so I'm getting along fine. And a guy approaches me and said, I'm having a terrible time. He says, everything's in Spanish, and I don't speak Spanish, and you look like you know what you're doing. And I said, he says, I'm going to Ecuador. And I said, well, so am I. And it turned out we were on the same plane. So I get him on the plane. I talk to him all the way down. I get him a taxi. We happen to be staying in the same hotel. I get him through the breakfast line where they didn't speak any English. Uh, and went back and forth, so I knew the guy well. I said, gee, this is a guy that I know he's certainly going to take care of me in Washington. It turns out, again, government, that I could take my month's vacation anywhere in the world I wanted to except back in the United States. I said, well, I am not giving up a year on a, on a fellowship at Harvard just because you guys can't get your act in gear and it took you so long to get me a clearance when I had a top secret cryptographic clearance, which you couldn't even find. Uh, was I still in the Navy? No. <laughs> we need to back up because the last year I was here, my third enlistment ran out. And these were four year enlistments. So to stay <laughs> as the leading petty officer in this company and to keep that by this time four dollars a week coming in I had to re-enlist for four years so I had one year more of active duty then I dropped out and I had a year in Gary in East Chicago then I had three years in the government again I was a GS 13 and I got promoted to a 14 after one year and I was still a third class petty officer <laughs> when the equivalent in the Navy was a full commander <laughs> But, again, government. But anyway, so I said, well, tough, you know, I'm going back. Uh, and uh, they said, well, well you're, you're going to be there for a full semester before your sabbatical starts. We really need you down here, so we're going to bring you back <laughs> for the month of May. <laughs> so I had two tours of duty in Ecuador. It cost them a mint. If I had gone on full time for the year, my subsistence and quarters would have dropped markedly and the way it was I got you know temporary duty which was even better pay so they had to pay my way down and back twice they had to keep my subs and quarters high again good old government uh, so I was at Harvard and then I came back to Pitt and uh, what else I guess I went down to Texas for three weeks on an NSF uh, fellowship on computing and uh, by that time I saw in the somewhere that Purdue wanted a uh, person to help staff a uh, Purdue Educational Research Center so I thought gee to go back to Purdue would be wonderful uh, this is a job which has a one course teaching load I get off the trimester uh, which is demanding mm -hmm. and never ends essentially go back to where I know where my wife had gone to school for a couple of years I don't have to commute uh, eight ten miles at certain hours because of the bridges uh, etc so uh, I got the job Mary Andres was running it she was a personal friend of Hovde uh, she was a very interesting woman, University of Chicago graduate who had spent some time in Africa, and uh, I was to be the technical consultant to her, which I was. It worked out beautifully. I was getting a lot done. Walked in in May, and she says, I'm leaving. And I thought, oh. <laughs> 
and uh, where'd she go? She went back uh, to uh, being a principal or assistant superintendent to one of the North Shore cities in Chicago. Of course, being a Chicago graduate, all she had to do was say, "I'm looking for," put me on the list again, and whammo, they picked her up. So, you were in the center. Yeah, uh, Ernie McDaniel and I, and uh, the boss came around and said to me, do you want to be director? And I said, no way. I've been an administrator. I'm good at it, but I'm a better researcher, and it's a lot more interesting. Looked at Ernie and said, do you want to be director? And Ernie said, no, nope. and the boss left. The next day, we get a letter appointing us as co-directors. I had in my contract when I came to Purdue, in fact, they did not want a person to be an administrator because Mary was, and in those days, men were tended to be administrators in education, and they didn't want a guy, you know, pumping up. And I, and so in my contract letter, it said I will be 12 months, I'll have a quarter time in psychology, I'll teach one course a semester, winter only, so not even in the summer. Uh, and I will have no administrative duties, and suddenly I have them. Uh, so I thought about it, and I said, I'm the only guy that really knows the government, having worked there four years, and uh, by the way, in the 10 years between the time I left got graduate school and came back was 10 years. And Remmers was on the advisory committee. I was a Purdue fact, had been a Purdue graduate. And audiology, or speech got a couple, psych got a couple, child development, sociology got a couple, education never got one with all those ties. And I said, you know, the time has come. <laughs> so I started working and by that time, my friend, the WAC captain had moved up to program planning and evaluation so she knew where all the money was. So I would go to Washington and take Alice to lunch and say, Alice, okay, who do I need to go see? And she would give me the list and I would go and come back and say to this faculty member, you know a lot, you've done a lot of publication, this would be a good match for you. So within two or three years we got something, quite a few contracts in education which made everybody very happy, sure, sure. and uh, so that worked. Yeah. Uh, Did you stay on to that for a while? Uh, eventually, that eventually they dissolved the, the, center. the center and moved me over to be assistant to uh, Bob Kane, who was by that time head of the department, okay. and eventually became dean. Right. And uh, I was doing the same thing, uh, essentially, on the staff of the head of the department, there was Bob Kane and Shelley Stone were head and assistant head. And uh, Bob called me in one day and said, they're starting a new job in PRF uh, to work with liberal arts and education uh, to promote research. He says, you've been doing it for how many years? Five years by that time? He says, I think you ought to apply. So I did and they turned me down. And I thought, what? And they appointed Alan Garfinkel, who never had a research contract in his life, was an associate professor, had worked only in Spanish and in education, while I had taught, co-taught in English. I had an appointment in psychology. I'd been in audiology and speech in the old speech department, which is now communication. I had ties throughout. So I thought, well, you know, so what? And Alan lasted about two months. And Bob came in and said, hey, he's not doing so well. That job is going to open up again. So it did. And I applied again, and they turned me down again. And I said, if I am not good enough to do that job, I am not good enough to do the job I've done here for these years. I quit, period. So I became a faculty member again. What would have been the nature of that job? to essentially be the research coordinator and get the ties to Washington, get contracts, just like I've been doing for education. Okay. Working with, and, help, and PRF would help the contacts. Except in English and communication and audiology and speech and psychology and education and up and down the line. Uh, and this was good old Ringel. 
picking his buddies again instead of competence. Ringel did that, I find out, throughout the university, and the whole place kind of did not really move ahead because of it. But uh, that's the way it was. Right. Now, you were in the, then, even though your degree is in psychology, you've always been in education at college. It turned out that when I got my first job after uh, East Chicago, was in the Office of Education. Right. Office of Education at that time was a very in small, Washington, in Washington, was sure. a very small outfit. They took me around and introduced me to every professional in one afternoon and one morning. Their budget now is $13 billion a year. <laughs> and uh, there were only three psychologists in the whole place. There was uh, Herb Conrad, who was editor of Psych Bulletin, committee, chair of the committee of uh, editors of the American Psych Association. There was another guy who worked for him uh, who was good. Uh, and uh, yeah, and uh, but it was nice in those early days. You got a lot of contacts, and you got well, yeah, well, I we went out to we were promoting research in universities, so right. Right. we yeah. had an excuse to go to negotiate the contract, which we could have done by phone. But I could run around to all the other departments and uh, rev up things. We had a budget of uh, a million two or three, then we had a budget of 2.3, then we had a budget of 3.2. NIH at that time was 78 million. They are, what, 23 billion now, something like that? And so I got to know a whopping number of really the top people in research. Well, when you come, and at that time, the Office of Education was predominantly Teachers College Columbia, uh, come down there and staff for the rest of their life. Not exactly exemplary, but uh, so when I came out of the Office of Education, they just assumed that I was a big E educator, which I'd only had, I think, three courses in education in my whole life. <laughs> mm. But, uh, and Ed Psych was in the psych department in those days. So I had all kinds of coursework in psychology and uh, not much in education. Well, I did. When I was taking 18 and 21 hours, I decided, well, you know, someday I may need a job as a teacher, so I better get a teacher's license while I'm here. So I took all those courses except practice teaching, and I could sit in the back of the class and do my homework for the other courses, and uh, uh, the faculty was not very high-powered, and uh, so it was Three extra hours was really not much beyond the 18, right. <laughs> really rigorous. Right. Uh, but I never did take practice teaching, and I really had no major. In those days, psychology was not good for a teacher's license, right. and uh, so I really couldn't have gotten a license. But when you came out of the Office of Education, everybody just assumed that you were a big E educator. Sure. And uh, then I was in the School of Education at Pitt only, and... Uh, but I taught STAT, I taught research methods, and uh, was a, uh, essentially a consultant to a lot of faculty members on their doctoral program right. and mm. sat on their committees. And so by that time, they figured I... Right. But Charlie Hicks was the head of the department here, and Charlie Hicks uh, was in the statistics department, right. uh, and he was an applied statistician. He'd been in education from Syracuse, and been a math major and then math ed and uh, research. So the first thing Charlie did when I applied for the job was call up uh, Anderson, who was over in the stat department still, that I'd had for coursework over there. And, and Anderson probably gave me a pretty good recommendation and said the guy knows statistics if he took my courses. Uh, and so that's essentially how I got the job. Sure. And uh, I asked if I couldn't pass an appointment in psychology and he called up the head of the department and said, uh, we haven't got any money, and Charlie said, I'll pay for it. So uh, I taught uh, STAT one semester with Ben Weiner and then I taught the 600 level course in theory of measurement for the, quite a few years after sure. that. Okay. But... Let's talk a little bit, make a, a question about John Feldhusen and the John felt, well, we were in South Campus Courts, per Perk was, and we were in the middle, 
and Ed Syke was on the far end. And John had been there a year or two, three, and had just made full professor and was moving up rapidly in the division of Ed Syke for the American Psych Association, mm -hmm. of which I was a member okay. and had made fellow. <laughs> Uh, well, I, as I finished Pitt, that's when I made fellows. So when I came to Purdue, I was a fellow of that division, sure. as was John. So we got together, and we were geographically together, which helps. And the course I taught was beginning research methods, which was in Ed Psych with John. So uh, I met with John, and John uh, had just gotten a contract for teaching, uh, masters and doctorates in research methods and said, gee, Bill, you've got excellent credentials. Do you want to be co-director with me? Happy to take that. So we had uh, Ertz and Gertz, <laughs> undergraduate research trainees and graduate educational research trainees, mm -hmm. and we had 10 doctoral students, and so we popped out research like crazy with, with these guys, and John and I got along beautifully and uh, taught together. And John got to be president of the division of Ed Psych, and he needed a guy to run uh, the program and appointed me chair, so I got to know a whole batch of people. And uh, there, from there went to other committees and eventually also became president of the division as a result of all those contacts. And one day John came in and said, uh, Bill, uh, there's a house for sale on Grant Street next near Stadium. A lady ran a rooming house and she died and it's in her estate. And I've checked it out and got a guy to appraise it and so I know what it's worth. And uh, But they're having the auction on Saturday, which was a little unusual. Uh, and he said, I'm teaching and running Super Saturday for the gifted students. So I can't go. Would you go for me? I said, I'm happy to spend other people's money. <laughs> sure, I'll go. Show me the way. Yeah, <laughs> point. <laughs> so uh, a couple of days later, John came by and said, by the way, Bill, uh, if you'd like to go with, in with me on this, uh, I'd like to have you. And I said, well, I'll think about it. And I'd been there three or four years by that time, and I thought about it. And I thought, everything I've done with John has been to my benefit. He's always given me full credit for everything I've done. In fact, every now and then he's given me credit, which I didn't really deserve and declined. So, you know, what can go wrong? Uh, so I didn't even go look at the house because he'd had it inspected and had it appraised Praised and everything right, else. Right, yeah. So I went and we bought the house. <laughs> and, the uh, two of you. Two, yeah, partnership went down and formed a legal partnership that John had scoped out the attorney to do this sort of thing, which was also good because it was the best real estate attorney in town and really a very nice guy and very good guy who's been my attorney ever since until he retired and now his son is my attorney. But uh, so we bought it. And uh, the good old how and good government again, the housing inspector, only half knew what he was doing. Uh, it had been a house built probably in the early 1900s. Uh, about uh, Whereabouts is it was it located? On Grant Street, just south of Stadium. Uh, it, it's a big apartment house now. Oh, okay. The house is no longer there? No. Oh, okay. uh, and I walked up the stairs, and I come around the corner, and there's a bathroom door and it's got a gap of about three inches because the floor is on an angle. The inspector hadn't even noticed it. Yeah. Uh, a number of other, so the first thing we did was buy a jack and go in the basement and jack the middle of the house up little by little. Uh, it had two bathrooms and four apartments, so all the bathrooms were shared. The next thing we did was break the place up so everybody had their own bathroom. Again, the housing inspector was perfectly all right with them. Uh, and uh, gradually we got the thing in shape, painted it, <laughs> uh, cleaned it up, 
put star screens in all the windows and uh, cleaned out the backyard. And the first year, we made a profit barely because you we had it as a rental. Hmm? Yeah, it was, it was total rental. Sure. Uh, three car garage that had been a laundry back in the days when early days, and the building had been built with a main section and then added on and then added on, which is why it was collapsing in the middle. And John knew a dean from Cranert who needed a place to park his boat. <laughs> so we could rent one stall of this because it was close to a guy with a car and rent two stalls to a boat. And we made off <laughs> profit off the garage just enough to break even. But... Uh, it was a new venture. <laughs> a new venture, and again, I worked with John more and more since we were partners on the thing. Sure, right. Yeah. But uh, it turned out that half the plumbing was on a septic tank. Back, again, back in the days before, they had sewers around there. And uh, one of the places where they added on, when they put in modern plumbing, they put the sewer pipe over the top of a sub-basement that had no sewer in it. So every time that thing ran over, sewage would come down, and John and I would be over there shoveling sewage. <laughs> and I said, just what two full professors <laughs> tenured need to be doing is shoveling sewage out of the basement. <laughs> uh, oh, dear. We also had a water pipe break out in the front yard, and John and I were over there in three feet of mud shoveling that out, so we had the water to all the apartments. And again, I said, John, you know, <laughs> there's better things that full professors could be doing than shoveling muddy water. Uh, How long did you keep the house? We kept that about four years. And Cochran came by and wanted to buy it. And Cochran was the talkative type, and I figured that, and he told me there were, I had, well, when I got married, uh, I had spent about two months in in the house next door and it was a dupla uh, front and back of a single family but had been divided the landlady lived in the house next to that and then the one we had which had now four apartments in it and uh, Cochran let slip that he owned the building north of us and the building south of us and he wanted to build an apartment building in there so we owned the building in the middle. The house. The house with four apartments in it that he needed. <laughs> so I said, Cochran, I'll tell you what. I will get the house appraised by this real estate man that you know, since you're in real estate, and you know that he's very accurate on West Side student housing. I will give you that price and that alone we have two mortgages on this thing, first mortgage and a second mortgage, and interest rates, we got it very low interest rates, and those interest rates are now considerably above that, and there's a difference in there, and so I will sell you that house at the appraised price, plus the advantage that we have in those two mortgages. And uh, so I sat down and figured out what those below cost mortgages were, which was quite a bit, and sold him at a very good price, considerably more than we had paid for it, and I knew that he had to have it, and uh, so we sold it to him. But, uh, and I'd taken the contract down to this lawyer who looked at it and said, it's fine, uh, and Cochran didn't want to pay cash because he was cash short at the time evidently. So he said down there where it gives a price in US, it doesn't say US dollars, so we need to stall and figure out what it's what the price actually is. All he wanted to do was knowing it would take a year and a half to get into court and then he would settle. So uh, but we had the rents kind of reasonable because all we did was rent for what the lady had rented and then if Purdue went up 2% we went up 2% when we, so we were considerably below the market while Mar Cochran knew what the, the value was and so he rented them considerably more than we were renting 
but we own the building and he's renting our, our building without our okay. So again, the lawyer called him and said uh, to Cochran, you really need to give the rents to these guys. So uh, we made money that way as well. And John, we were, and this took two years, and John was getting very anxious. John could not stand uncertainty. And finally he says, you know, we really need to get rid of that building. I said, we can't. We got a contract to sell it. And we got to go to court to break it or fi finalize it. Right. And John kept agonizing and agonizing and uh, saying, we need to. I finally said, John, we know precisely what it's worth. We had it appraised. The guy is willing to accept our appraisal and buy it at that rate. Uh, we know what the mortgages are now that it's been two years and they've kept dropping down and we kept dropping them more because we were getting that extra rent in. So essentially worked out that this was the value of the house plus subtract the mortgages. And John owned half and I owned half. And I, so I bought him out and uh, went another year or so, finally went to court and we settled going up the courthouse steps because this is what Cochran wanted in the long run anyway. Yeah. And uh, so we go to the closing and the lawyer says, make sure you get a certified check because this guy is a little shaky. And Cochran's brother, I think it was Jim, he's still around, hauled out the company, you know, three company checkbook, which has three checks in it, not certified, and writes out a check, which was pretty good size, like fifty or sixty thousand dollars at that point. And the lawyers didn't say a thing, so I took it. Signed all the papers, giving him title, and he says, that check is on Lafayette Bank and Trust. He says, do you know anybody there? I said, no, I don't. He says, I'll go with you and introduce you to the vice president. So we go downtown, and the vice president's sitting up in a raised desk down on the main floor, goes in and introduces me in a big chat. What are you here for, ultimately? Uh, I've got this check from Cochran, and I'd like to cash it and get a certify, a, a bank, a, a cashier's check from you people. Fine. Calls the girl, take this, deposit it, make out a cashier's check to this gentleman. About 10 minutes, the girl comes back, <laughs> and the guy's face drops, and he says, that check is no good. <laughs> a $60,000 check. And the lawyer says, what? Picks up the phone, calls the other guy's lawyer, and said, give me a guarantee you won't clear any of those contracts or titles until we get the money. So we finally got it. So again, another venture with John that worked out beautifully. Right. Everything I ever did with John worked yeah. out magnificently. Yeah. And it turned out that ultimately John sold his house. I got married and bought a house out in uh, Camelback and turned out John is just down the street. John then goes to Florida, lives in Sarasota. We went to Florida, lived in Bradenton, went back and forth all the time. John lived in a ultimately lived in a condominium right on uh, Sarasota Bay. Gorgeous. Lots of entertainment. Excellent food. John invited us down regularly. Wonderful. And then yeah. Hazel died. And then John had to go into a nursing home. And so we went down frequently and visited him. Yeah. Let's talk about family. Now you have children. Um, I have four children. Did they come to, did they go to Purdue? One went to Purdue. Okay. And, uh, where do your children live now? Two okay. live in Indianapolis and two live in Dallas. Okay. And the son that went to Purdue uh, was a general biology major. Met a girl here who was a computer major. She graduated from Purdue, so I had a daughter-in-law. Eventually they got divorced, but nevertheless, I had a son with a Purdue degree, a wife with a Purdue degree, another wife with two Purdue degrees, and I have two Purdue degrees, so we're pretty well tied in. Sure. And now I have a grandson who's uh, a junior in uh, aeronautical engineering. Good. Who's at Purdue? 
Did your first wife pass away? Yeah, she died oh. uh, about 12 years ago. Oh, okay. But... Uh, and then you, you moved into Camelback where you're living? Uh, in? Yeah. Okay. okay. What, new wife wants new house, as you may well imagine. So we sold the old house and... Right. But it worked out very well. So. Yeah, it's a nice, it's a close location. It's a nice location. Uh, yeah, and we're getting ready to, in about a year and a half to move into Westminster. So. Okay. Are you going to have a house or an apartment? We're going to have an apartment, yeah. a big one, yeah. about the same size as our apart uh, condominium Sounds now. Good. So. Let's talk up some about uh, your awards. You were with the well, the kids. kids. I'll give you a, the kids. Yeah, and then your awards. Uh, two kids went to IU. Okay. One was a psych major. When he announced he was going to be a psych major, I said, that's very flattering, but you're about 15, 20 years too late. There's no jobs in psychology anymore. My daughter uh, was a social, uh, social work major. Yeah, from IU. IU, okay. then went up to Indianapolis to finish it off and got her master's in social work. She now, and she learned to sign while she was there for some reason or other. And eventually she's now a social worker counselor in the school for the deaf because she can sign and do that uh, my son uh, works f two jobs three jobs actually he teaches guitar on the side he works for a company that does construction work uh, repairing houses uh, your roof blows off the insurance company says it's worth so much he goes and says we'll re-roof the roof for what your insurance is worth etc and he also sells uh, health and life insurance. So if you need health or life insurance, I can give you a tie. Uh, my son, uh, son, bachelor's degree in psychology, uh, eventually went to Dallas, Texas, where uh, the older brother of my best friend in high school who lived down the street from me, and we both enlisted, he's about two months younger than I am, and we both enlisted in the Navy at the same time. He had worked in the electric shop and repaired radios all during high school, and I had had four years of math. And to be a radar technician, you had to take what was known as the Eddy test, which was a test in electronics and in math. I tutored him in math. He tutored me in electronics. We both passed the test. We both get stalled getting called up to active duty. When we did get called up, we were both in the same boot camp company, which is, you know, there's over a thousand boot camp companies over a course of a year, and we both got in the same one, which was miraculous. Uh, he got sick and got dropped back a company or two. I went to this high school in Chicago for a month, then went to Gulfport. I'm in Gulfport for about a month, and they had four huge chow halls, and they had 10,000 sailors down there. I'm sitting in there, and in walks my friend, who had also been sent down there. So we spent another three or four months together down there. And uh, his older brother had been in the Navy and w had been in the Battle of Taro. He was in the fifth, fourth or fifth wave going in. Uh, how he survived, except he was about six, two or three, and had been a quarter miler in high school. And they dropped him off out about half a mile because they had misjudged the tides and he zigzagged in high stepping all the way and landed on the beach and went in about 20, 40, 50 feet, stayed all night with Japanese voices all around him and managed to survive the Battle of Tarawa. And he eventually went to law school and then uh, became a private investigator down in Dallas. And my son got tired of working in Indianapolis and he and his girlfriend moved to Dallas. And I said, well, I got a friend down there, look him up. And Bill passed a civil service test and was a housing inspector in Dallas. And uh, so one of the things you had to do was find out who owned the property. And Texas had Mexican land, uh, Spanish land grants, Mexican land grants, the state of Texas, and then the state of Texas as part of the United States, so their land records are very complex, and Bill learned how to work them, which is one of the things you need to do. And my friend's older brother hired Bill to work for him because he knew how to work the land grants, and eventually hired Bill and taught him how to uh, become a private investigator, pass the tests and everything else. So Bill is still a private investigator. 
uh, his now wife uh, had a master's in, was a nurse and had a master's in nursing finance, health finance, so she consulted with nursing homes and now is consulting in all these health things uh, with nursing homes in Dallas. And then my youngest son uh, is an auto tech, went to Vincennes uh, and got his associate degree and then moved down to Dallas and works for uh, uh, dealerships down there. So that's the two boys in Dallas, the two uh, son and daughter. And uh, my daughter married a Purdue engineer, which growing up in West Lafayette, she swore she would never do. <laughs> uh, and uh, he uh, works for Eli Lilly. And uh, they have two boys, one of whom is here at Purdue now. So we're accumulating Purdue. Sounds good. Relationships. Yeah. A couple of your awards you got uh, that you were the fellow, as you said, with the AAAS, the Education Section and Psychology Section, right? Well, actually, I have it's Psych and Education and Social Sciences and okay. what? <laughs> it's strange. The American Association. It, of I, I became an American Educational Research Association when I started working for the Office of Education. It turned out that Remmers had been president of that when I was in graduate school here. I'd never heard of the organization. I go to the Office of Education and I'm working research contracts and they said, gee, you really ought to become a member of this thing. So I became a member and the guy says, oh, you have a master's degree. That makes you a, an automatic a full member. I said, fine, who cares, you know. <laughs> so when I got ready to go to Pitt, I was selling my house. I knew I would no longer have those interest deductions because I was renting in, in Pittsburgh. So I said, I'll take the money that I get from selling this house and I will become a life member of AAAS. I'll become a life member of National Geographic. I'll become a life member of Phi Delta Kappa, the education. Right. It turns out that if you are, and then I go down to AAAS and say, hey, I want to become a life member. And they said, oh, you're a member, a full member of AERA. Anybody who's a full member of AERA is an automatic fellow of AAAS. <laughs> so that's how I became a, a, a fellow of AAAS in 1958. And I just got a certificate that says you can get an, oh, you get 50 issues of science every week. <laughs> so I have now had science every 50 weeks a year for 50 years. Uh, and I offered to give them to libraries, and they don't want them. You, I think. <laughs> because That's they got them stacked sense. sky high. Yeah. But I got a certificate the other day and said, you're now a 50-year member. You can have dues-free for the rest of your life and science-free for the rest of your life. And I said, I've already got them. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> so uh, that's... I that's how one become, moves up the ladder academically. Well, I, my, if anyone says you have a lifetime guarantee, I'm not interested because it's way beyond what well, I'm Well, I was right. 30, at that time, right. 38 years old or 39 at the time. I figured I had a few years to right. left. That, uh, George, but I get down in Ecuador. <laughs> and uh, Ecuador, Quito is 9,200 feet up. And they have the Battle of the Clouds, which is at 11,000 feet. And they got a monument up there. And so every once in a while we decide to go hiking in the mountains and we take a taxi up to the Battle of the Monument, 11,000, then we go up another 1,000 feet, walk along the side of the mountain and come back down. Uh, I misjudged one Sunday afternoon and I'm about halfway down and it gets dark. And you do not come down that mountain in the dark. So I sat up there all night long. The temperature is about 40. I had a lighter jacket than this one on. It's raining. And I'm thinking, did I waste all my money in those life memberships or am I going to get out of this place? Well, I got out of it finally. Oh. But uh, I still went through my stuff the other day looking for or a reprint. And there's the letter from the ambassador to all USAID and embassy personnel saying, if you're going hiking in the mountains, be sure and tell us where you're going because if we have to send out the Marine Guard to go look for you, we're going to charge you for it. All right. You got that George Wiedemer Award in, uh, from the Conference on Distant Teaching and Learning. Yeah. That's very nice. 
Well, one of the things I did was I knew Gene Glass, who was at Colorado at the time. And Gene Glass was the youngest president of AERA, and I went to his presidential address, and it was a meta-analysis of therapy, clinical therapy and psychology. And meta-analysis was the first time anybody in the behavioral sciences had really had a decent way of combining literature. We had tried before, and nothing ever really made sense or worked very well. People counted the number of significant articles, non-significant, which is a very bad way to do it. Uh, they tried combining probability statements, which immediately get you up to one in a thousand, and it's nonsense. And Gene figured out a way to do it. So I went on sabbatical, learned meta-analysis from the master, came back, uh, did it for a couple of years, and then went up to, on sabbatical to uh, Larry Hedges, who had refined and put good statistical underpinning under meta-analysis. Uh, this is obviously the way to go in the behavioral and social sciences because it gives you a much broader base of theory and sure. a much stronger base. And uh, I had a student who was interested in distance education. And there had been 30 articles, none of which could get statistical significance because the samples were too small. And the measurement was not highly uh, precise. So you get 30 non-significant. And she said, I think we can do better in meta-analysis the way. Well, we had 15, 18, 20 studies. So we had a sample size of a couple thousand, which is tremendous power and we demonstrated indeed distance education is slightly better, not a whole lot, but s slightly. Uh, and the first time it had ever been demonstrated. So this organization of which she was a member uh, gave us the award of the best article and we each got $1,000 for it, which was really nice. Sounds good. So I really liked that graduate student uh, and got the award and so. Very nice. It was really quite an honor, and uh, it was this graduate student plus the meta-analysis, which I was now proficient at, that did it, and uh, <laughs> we had a few others. I've been doing meta-analysis with students for quite a while now, so. That's good. And every time we did one, well, we did one on gifted ed, that clearly, beyond any doubt, demonstrated that uh, uh, skipping grades is well worthwhile. And that had always been very difficult because the samples, again, are very small. Very small, right, yeah. How about uh, uh, favorite Purdue tradition? Do you have a favorite Purdue tradition? <laughs> I love Purdue football. Sounds good. I have, well, when I came as a graduate student, they were still letting students in free. So I went, uh, and I think the whole time I was in graduate school, they let students in free. It wasn't too long ago that they started. And... Uh, to buy tickets. Then when I came, then I was gone 11 years at the Office of Education in East Chicago and uh, Pitt came back and of course faculty got a discount so I got season tickets and I've gotten season tickets ever since. My son being a Purdue graduate is in the Purdue whatever uh, that uh, athletic support so oh, John Purdue Club? Yeah, uh -huh. so he and I get tickets together, so I'm not in my better seat that I'd worked years to get up to the 18-yard line, but uh, I still get to, I can see it, right, yeah. you know, get to sit with my son-in-law, and we have long conversation. So I've been to every Purdue home football game, except once when I had a funeral of a good friend of the family, and we now have a convention that meets on Saturday, and three or four times I've had to go to the convention rather than the football game, but I've now been here uh, about f how many years? I came in 66, so we're, what, 43 years? Right. I'm That's pretty good. Had four, five, and six football home football games for that long is a lot of football games. That's right. What uh, about your uh, post-Purdue? What are you doing in your post-Purdue activities? I volunteer for the Gifted and Talented Program. Again, okay. John ran this thing and involved oh, me yeah. in it got me interested in NAGC. Uh, I really think that the place I can put my limited efforts and skills that will benefit society more than any other place I can put them 
is in facilitating gifted ed. Uh, we had Sydney Moon, who was one of John's students, rent it for a year until we got the current faculty. They're very good. In fact, uh, they've just gotten a huge grant for five years uh, to do research. And so they invite me in, and uh, they give me a third of a graduate student office, and I'm not here in the wintertime, so it doesn't hurt them too much. I'm on their advisory committee. I still go to the National Association of Gifted Children and uh, know a lot of people there. It's a small convention, and so I really enjoy that. Sure. I'm also on the board of uh, Beacon Academy, which is a charter school for kids on the other end of the spectrum who've either flunked out of high school or been high school didn't serve them very well. And we're trying to, it's a small group of this semester, this year it has. Is two, it local? Is it yeah, here? it's out, uh, it was housed down in uh, uh, the science thing down just across the river. And now we're out in uh, the temple out on uh, Cumberland. And it has a woman PhD from Purdue who is principal and runs the place. And uh, she heard of my reputation when she was, I never had her in class, but she knew about me. And she knew I had considerable doubts about the high school curriculum. And so she invited me to be on the board and said, I've never taught school. I've never, and the only th I was a janitor on the school board labor gang for four or five years. My father was a principal. My mother was a teacher. That's all I know about education. She says, well, I like your views on curriculum, which I kept saying. I used to start my classes, and I, I taught the doctoral research seminar for people working on their thesis. And I said, okay, you're all experts. Uh, let me say, start off as a conversation generator that I think the secondary curriculum is fraudulent. And... Uh, you can argue against me perfectly fine, except I want you to show me data of which there isn't any. In the field of English literature, you require you take four years of English literature. There's not one study that says what English literature accomplishes. And I said I can go through uh, a few other areas uh, do the same thing. Uh, and nobody ever said a thing because they knew there wasn't any. So... Uh, she f heard me make that statement, and so she said, well, I want a different curriculum. We want to see what we can do for these kids. We want you on the board. So I became a member of the board, which I think is really very fulfilling. And uh, so I work on both ends. Any closing comments? I'll leave it up to you. Anything special you want to close with? Well, I think I'm enormously fortunate in life having caught the very end of World War II, uh, having gone to a pretty good high school. Uh, my father steered me into DePaul, which I really wasn't enthusiastic about, but went anyway, and it was really one of the great opportunities of my life because I had an excellent psych department with a guy who had been a math teacher and taught stat there, and. I did well in it, came to Purdue, took all the stat and measurement courses in my master's degree in psych, and then went through the stat sequence later. Come to Purdue, which had a really a, a pretty good psych department. It had an industrial psych, which was applied psych, which I took a lot of their courses. Uh, then hit the Office of Education when the very first extramural research that they supported. Went to a lot of universities around the United States, made a lot of friends. And went to Pitt, which treated me very well. Went to Got the sabbatical to Harvard, which was excellent. Uh, worked with John Carroll there. Took a man named Gross, who was one of the top sociology administration faculty. Took some courses on qualitative analysis of by computer analysis of written records brilliant still hasn't that's been 40 years ago and they still haven't caught up in psychology to do personality analysis in that method came back to Purdue again western Indiana where I knew very well have all kinds of 
my great grandfather had 12 kids. My great great grandfather had 12 kids, all in Owen County. I've got relatives up one side and down the other. My mother's family down in Knox County, and a lot of relatives down there. Uh, so I'm very much, a, and you know, growing up in Gary, so I really kind of got thrown back into the briar patch, essentially. Purdue has gotten better and better over the years. Hubdy ran the place with an iron hand. Uh, I've worked with the engineers. I've worked with uh, the civil engineers in traffic safety. I've worked with uh, the health people. I've worked with uh, English rhetoric people, which is an excellent group. Taught in psychology, t taught in education, worked with Ed Psych. You know, just really uh, married two Purdue graduates, both just really fine women. You know, four kids that have done well. Uh, you know, we can't ask for any more. Sounds good. Thank you very much, Dr. Thank Richard. you. I appreciate it. My pleasure.